I could be wrong, but I've been told it's been a long time since somebody stood in there and preached. Uh, so, you know, I don't know what the deal is, but I'm going to do it here, okay? Uh, I was also going to say go 49ers, but I'm not going to say that, okay? Uh, yeah, okay, whatever. We're just going to say go have a safe, sane, sober Super Bowl, okay? Uh, will you all pray with me, please? Gracious God, we ask for your light to shine upon us, surround us, warm us, <laughs> infuse us, uh, still us, make it safe for us to be here now and to open our hearts to your word of love and light. Bless the words of my mouth and the words of meditation in our hearts and these words of scripture and take them and make them your loving and your living word. We pray in the name of Jesus, the word who became flesh for us. Amen. So on a sabbatical in Ireland, I climbed uh, Krog Padrig, uh, which means Patrick's Mountain, 2,507 feet over Clue Bay in County Mayo. Anybody ever been there? Oh, good. We'll have to talk after the service. It's called Patrick's Mountain because St. Patrick is said to have spent the 40 days of Lent on this mountain. And we begin the season of Lent this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. Patrick spent Lent on this mountain in prayer and fasting before beginning his public ministry on Easter. Climbing Krog Padrig is a, a spiritual pilgrimage for many people, a symbolic act representing the journey of life, for which the journey of Lent is meant to be a kind of mini version, a time to focus more deeply or more intently on the spiritual dimensions of life. And the Transfiguration is a kind of a bridge between the season of Epiphany and the season of Lent. And it's also a mini celebration of Easter. We've got the Alleluia banner over here. And we won't, I am assuming you observe the tradition, we won't uh, sing or say or see Alleluia again until Easter. The vision of the transfigured Christ is a vision of the risen Christ in glory on Easter a foretaste of the feast to come before Jesus begins his journey to Jerusalem and his teaching about the way of the cross and suffering and death. Celtic Christians have this uh, concept or idea called uh, collate. In Gaelic, that means thin places. The thin places are where the veil between heaven and earth, between the spiritual and the physical, is said to be very thin. That there is access to the spiritual realm from or through the physical world. Or the physical world and the spiritual world have, have melded together and been joined. Now we would call them holy places. And indeed, uh, Krog Padrig is also called Ireland's Holy Mountain. And this was certainly the disciples' experience on the mountain of the Transfiguration in our Gospel reading this morning. It was a thin place for them. We all have places, uh, don't we, where, where the spiritual or the divine seems more present to us? We just feel the divine presence in those places or, or in those moments if we pay attention, if we stop to linger and experience it, if we look, and listen. As the voice from the cloud said in the Transfiguration story, this is my beloved, listen to him. Patrick's Mountain is a, a thin place for many people, and I experienced that almost immediately. As I stood at the point where the paved path ends and the dirt trail begins, there, there's a little gate there. I hesitated, I took a deep breath, and opened the gate, stepped off the pavement and onto the trail, and it was literally like I passed through a veil 
of some kind. I could physically feel it gently pressing against my face and the, and the front of my body, like a curtain uh, made of gauze or silk. It's almost like how it feels when you're trying to move underwater. Uh, it seemed like everything slowed down and I moved more slowly and deliberately. The colors of the green grass and the blue sky became more vivid and intense. I noticed sounds more readily and acutely. Uh, the trickling of the little brook or stream that, that ran along the side of the trail. Birds singing. The bleating of the sheep grazing nearby. And the sound of the bells that some of the sheep wore. I noticed little things I might not have otherwise missed. The tiniest uh, wildflowers were beginning to bloom. It suddenly felt warmer, and, and I shed my jacket and climbed in my shirt sleeves. I kept having to stop and write in my journal, which I had in my pack. Words and thoughts kept coming, tumbling, washing over me like, like that little stream nearby. Words and thoughts that were answers to questions I had that clarified confusing situations I thought I had left at home, but actually I carried them with me. We always do that, the stuff we think we've left, you know. Words and thoughts that gave direction to my life and, and gave new purpose and meaning. And I had to write it down right away, lest I forget. It was all so important and so precious and sweet. And because I would stop so often to write, it puzzled me that I kept seeing some of the same people on the trail. I mean, they should have been way ahead of me. Apparently, others were, were stopping along the way, too. In particular, there were three young women I kept seeing. No matter how often I stopped, it seemed like I would see them up ahead of me, like they had somehow waited for me for some reason. It turns out that they were from Brittany, the Celtic part of France. I discovered that at the top of the mountain uh, while we all rested there and shared the food that we had each brought and talked a bit. But that came later. In the meantime, as I said, I kept seeing them along the way. And I thought of them as the three graces in Scripture, faith, hope, and charity, or, or divine love, as they would pass me or I would pass them and they would smile and wave. I found it very comforting and encouraging uh, being alone and a stranger in a strange land. Especially as the going got tougher and rougher. The last part of the hike up Krog Padrig is all rock. There is a point at which there's no more grass, no vegetation of any kind, no dirt even, <laughs> just rocks and gravel. And it's slippery, and it's hard, and it's very steep. And the gravel gives way under your feet. Sometimes it's, you know, one step forward or up, and then you slide back down as the gravel gives way, uh, two or three steps back. Uh, one truly trudges up this mountain. And it's amazing how quickly the most conditioned person can become winded and tired. There's a struggle being the three graces, uh, lifted my spirits. The view from the top of Calm Clue Bay and, and the wide Atlantic beyond uh, is spectacular. I sat there looking out on the water, almost at eye level with the clouds, and uh, tears came to my eyes. A sense of, of more of, of that divine presence washing away all that I needed to leave behind on the top of that mountain so that the journey down and the journey home might be lighter. I felt I was truly being accompanied by a divine presence. As Peter on the mountain of transfiguration spoke for the disciples saying, you know, it's good for us to be here. 
And he wanted to stay, to build dwellings and, and not leave. But he knew he must go down the mountain as surely as they went up. And the divine presence accompanied them going down onto the plain. Indeed, the divine presence can be found in the valleys, even in the valley of shadow. As we make this transition into Lent and our journey to the cross and to Easter, may this Lent be a reminder that all of life is a journey in which God accompanies us everywhere. May this Lent be a time for you to experience the thin places along the way. Those places and those moments when the presence of God is palpable and, and you feel the connection and you're touched by grace and you are transfigured by what is divine and holy May you find rest and renew your strength physically uh, and find rest for your soul. You know, there's this, this post-COVID tiredness and, and even weariness that we may not always not acknowledge and, and from which we have not completely recovered yet. Uh, the ways that COVID was, was hard and scary, and, and we carried a lot of anxiety within us during that time. And some of us may still feel anxious about going out. And there are still things this church did before COVID that you haven't done yet or since. And then this community started to acknowledge that a beloved pastor was facing a serious health issue and that your beloved pastoral team of over 20 plus years was going to retire. You may not have been ready for that. It's okay to acknowledge that it's been hard and even scary, and that there's grief about your beloved pastors leaving. And now you're in this time of transition uh, that's also full of uncertainty, and, and even anxiety. And here we go with another presidential election cycle that seems fraught with more anxiety and uncertainty. And you know, maybe it just feels like too much, eerie of it all. And wouldn't it be nice to just stay on the mountaintop a while with Moses and Elijah and Jesus and all of his glory? Here's the thing, if we do that, we miss out on the joy of the journey. May you not miss out on the astounding joy of this journey that is before us. All of its beauty and greatness, whether it's about seeing or doing some big things or, or something small, even tiny. You know, sometimes those so-called tiny things are not so tiny. <laughs> they can be so very big and beautiful and amazing and full of grace. May you know that you do not journey alone, but are accompanied by the God who walks with us and who sends others to walk with us. Maybe complete strangers like my three graces on Krog Padrig. They may be family, dear friends, fellow church members, and pastors. Connect with them all. Like the title of the book that you're all, at least some of you are all reading, uh, How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply. And may you connect with God's word, you know, which you hear read aloud in church, and hopefully you read at home, and which the Spirit will speak in your heart. 
May you share food for the journey at many points and many times along the way in all the ways that God feeds us, not the least of which will be the holy meal that we share this morning. Now, some people experience Lent as a kind of a downer, uh, a dark, stark time of self-denial, you know, that can be depressing, uh, or they just ignore Lent like it doesn't matter and it really makes no difference. That is not God's intention or desire. God wants to encounter us and connect with us and there is joy in that. Like the disciples encountered God on the mountain of transfiguration. And there were so many different encounters and points of connection on that mountain. You know, Moses, Elijah, the cloud, the voice, the glory, the dazzling white light, concluding not only with the transfiguration of Jesus, but with the transfiguration of the disciples themselves. They were all changed in way. And that's what God wants for you and for me and for this church in this Lenten season, transfiguration. That's what God wants for you and for me and for this church in this time of transition. Transfiguration. What if uh, the transition process is really a transfiguration What might that look like for you and for First Emmanuel? For one thing, it may mean that at the very time when you want to hurry up and get through this transition so you can get past the anxiety and get on to calling a new pastor, that you slow down and look, listen. Because God is going to be revealed in this process and you don't want to miss it. So let it take as long as it takes. It may mean that at the very time when you are tempted to pull back and, and check out for a while because you're weary and, and you've had enough that you stay engaged and get involved and look and listen. Because God is going to be revealed in this process and you don't want to miss it, so stay with it and let it take as long as What if God wants this time of transition to be nothing less than a transfiguration? Like a prayer that's very dear to me. Uh, I've carried a copy of this in my wallet for over 40 years. It's gone with me all over the world, including into some very scary, dangerous places and situations. And I know some of you know this prayer. Uh, Sometimes it's called the Holden Village Prayer. Uh, because it's been used there when people leave community at the end of a retreat. It's also in our hymnal. Uh, It's part of the liturgies for morning and evening prayer. It was actually written by an Anglican British army chaplain in the First and the Second World Wars, Eric Milner White, who later became the dean of the chapel of King's College in Cambridge. I want to close by, by reading this prayer to you. It goes like this. O God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us, your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Think about it, that could have been the prayer of the disciples as they came down from the mountain of transfiguration. And it's a fitting prayer for the beginning of this transition process. So I'd like to pray it together in closing. If you would take the red hymn book, I bet it's in there, find page 304 in the front of the book where the page numbers are at the bottom page 304. And if you're Zooming or watching this on YouTube and you don't have access to uh, a hymnal, uh, would you just close your eyes and, and listen to the words as we pray them together? Let's pray together. Bottom there. 
O oh God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us through Jesus Christ our Lord.